So today is mostly an update on ongoing work. Um, we'll, we'll give you guys, I'm just gonna move this here so I can look at the camera. Um, so we'll give everyone a, an update on, on a few things that we've been working on. Um, specifically, I think everyone's had a hint already about the third party API conversation. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, that's sort of, I would call the state of that work in sort of conceptual uh, design state. Uh, the ISO 222 POC update um, has to do with uh, exploring ISO 222 integration from an external network. So how do we connect Moduli to other networks that use 222? So we're in the process of building a POC there. And then um, Jordi gave a, a quick um, talk as part of the core updates yesterday around some work he's been doing with a test toolkit. Uh, so we're gonna give a little demo of that as well as the simulators um, that he's, uh, he and the cloud payments team have been building um, for ATM and point of sale transactions. So uh, first up the third party APIs, um, as I mentioned uh, during the PISP talk, the thing that we found really interesting and exciting about the third party APIs is their general applicability across a number of use cases. And uh, the fact that building these APIs directly into the hub, into Moduloop, um, really opens up an exciting bunch of use cases that are re generally require um, a lot of work from the DFSPs to enable in, in payment systems. So the traditional way that a third party would integrate into um, a, a domestic payment system it would be directly through some one of the um, participants rather than through the hub. Uh, so uh, an example of that would be open banking in Europe where, uh, you know, for the last number of years, the banking community has been working on API standards that require third parties to connect to the banks. And as Google um, pointed out in their white paper on real-time payments, um, that model uh, puts a lot of um, a huge burden of uh, integration burden onto the financial service providers, as well as the third parties. Uh, it's kind of a cop out, in fact, by the domestic payment system where the domestic payment system could provide a centralized point for those integrations and really unlock innovation. Um, so we're excited about that and applying that model to use cases that uh, we've been working on, um, most specifically the ATM and POS integration and the cross network integration. So at, at a very high abstract level, the third party APIs allow some third party to initiate a transaction. Um, we had hints of this in the Moduloop API uh, with the merchant request to pay use case and the transaction request message. But really what this is, is a, is a higher level thing where the third party is not necessarily one of the, or is explicitly not one of the participating DFSPs. So they're um, passing a request into the system and saying, hey, um, I want this transaction to happen. And I think what's important here to note here is something that um, uh, we discussed uh, within the DA and then have been discussing further in various conversations since is that the orchestration of the transaction is still up to the, um, the payer DFSP. So the payer DFSP will, will be the, the recipient of this initiation request. Uh, and then they'll be responsible for completing all of the back and forth um, messaging that's required to execute the transaction. Uh, and, and we'll see, I'll talk through the three use cases in a second that we're interested in and explain how that works. The next thing that the third party APIs um, expose is the ability for the third party to be presented with the quote. So at the end of the quoting phase, um, they get presented with the quote uh, and are given the opportunity to authorize the transaction. And, and that can take a variety of forms depending on the use case. And finally, uh, they're notified of the outcome. And um, there's a, some really interesting work going on there in trying to define a more generic mechanism for notifications from the hub, uh, which Lewis also mentioned as something that they're exploring in the PISP stream. So um, in general, quite excited about a lot of the work out of PSP, um, having a broader applicability, number of use cases that we can explore. So let me go into a little more detail on the um, use cases that we're looking at. So the cross-network POC that we're doing is a proof of concept integration with uh, a system called TCIB at Bank Serve Africa, which is an ISO 222 based system. Um, and the use case we're looking at is inbound peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments. Now, 
the way we're proposing to do that is that uh, you would have uh, this role called a cross network provider, an entity who participates in the external network in some form and uh, provides a bridging or a gateway into the modulate network. And in this case, uh, the cross network provider would receive an ISO 222 message from uh, the Bankso system, the TCIB system, and based on that would initiate a transaction in the modulate system. So uh, in our case, we're assuming uh, for an incoming payment, this cross network provider is holding an account at the payer DFSP, and they're behaving a lot like a PISP. They're sending a transaction request or an initiation in, uh, request into the system and asking their own DFSP to um, initiate the payment. And what will happen is the payer DFSP will do, you know, the lookups, make sure that the recipient exists, um, will initiate the quote, and then we'll pass that quote back to the CMP and say, hey, uh, this is what it's going to cost to deliver this. Um, are you happy? And the CMP will have internal business rules that will have to consult to decide whether to proceed with the transaction or not. It'll, let's assume it does, it'll send the, trans, uh, the response back and the payer DFSP will complete the transfer, the CNP will be notified and it will be able to respond back to the bank serve system. The, the challenge that we're overcoming here is that the ISO 222 message for this use case is a simple single request and response. And so we've got to do a lot of um, back and forth and orchestration within the Moduleap system um, to effectively come out with a binary outcome. It either succeeded or it failed. Uh, and so that's what we're busy working on. And I'll provide a little more detail on the status of that particular work stream in a minute. On the ATM uh, side, something we're exploring, and, and this is still in design phase, is uh, the model, which is probably more common than um, than the model we've had to date, which was an aggregator model. And that is of a, some sort of an ISO. So, uh, a um, independent system operator who runs a whole lot of ATMs. Um, this may be a bank, uh, but it, it's often also an independent entity runs either branded or non-branded ATMs. Um, but the, the point being that they provide technical uh, integration into this network of ATMs, which is generally uh, running on ISO 8583. So in this case, the ATMizer would run the uh, legacy payment system adapter that we've developed, and they would be receiving messages from the terminals or a terminal driver. Uh, and instead of uh, acting on behalf of the pay DFSP, which was our previous model, they would act uh, as a third party and initiate a payment um, where to an account that they hold or that the terminal owner holds at the pay DFSP. So you can see how this ATMizer can be uh, providing technical integration without actually being a participant in the transfer of funds. So they may have a completely out of band relationship with the payee um, and the owner of the a of the ATMs for uh, reimbursement for their services. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be charging a per transaction fee or anything like that. And that's a very common model. Um, finally, the, the third use case is uh, the merchant um, or point of sale use case. And this is a very common model for uh, especially large merchants, tier one, what we call tier one merchants, either um, running their own fleet of multi-lane retail terminals themselves or outsourcing that to an ISO in, the, in a similar manner to the ATM model. And the merchant will be acquiring transactions on their terminals and then forwarding those into the system to initiate a transaction between the payer and payee DFSP. And in this case, the merchant would um, hold an account, for example, at the payee DFSP. Uh, this could obviously take the ISO model as I described with the ATM where the merchant holds the account at the payee DFSP, but actually the entity driving the terminals for the merchant is a third party. Also a very common model um, for merchants, especially smaller tier two, tier three merchants who don't have the uh, ability to run a full um, uh, you know, fleet of terminals themselves. So that's where we're looking to go with the third party APIs in terms of those three use cases. And the state of that, as I said, currently is, is sort of early designs. Um, myself, Lewis, Michael, uh, Sam, uh, JJ, others have been putting our heads together over the last little while to think about um, what this should look like more generally. Um, 
uh, recently put together a sort of concept, the beginnings of a concept document, and we've invited Leslie and Miller and anyone else who's interested um, to provide some input on that. So I'll, I'll share a link to that document um, after the presentation, but at the moment it's, like I say, a very rough uh, concept, um, just captured in a Google Doc for now. I'll pause there for a second just to see if there's any questions specifically on the third party APIs and then got a quick update on some of the other work streams. Okay. Um, ISO 222 cross network PSC. Uh, so this is the, if you were um, paying attention during the mid PI review, some of this will look familiar. Obviously scope and goal haven't changed here. Um, a reminder for anyone who's not aware of this work stream, um, we're developing an adapter, a, a proof of concept adapter between the module loop and an existing ISO 222 base network, as I mentioned, the bank serve TCIB system. Uh, the goal here is to identify any challenges we, we may encounter in interoperating with an ISO 222 base system. So we build the POC, we get messages flowing back and forward. Um, we go through the exercise of trying to map those messages, map those flows identify gaps and, and that will help us to uh, plot our path forward. Um, where we are currently, we've mapped out the flows at a high level using the third party API. So that was a, um, a development probably since the mid PI review where we had originally done um, some field mappings and some uh, mappings based on how we were previously thinking about the uh, pause and ATM flows. Uh, we are planning to adjust the tech spec to reflect the third party API usage. Um, so that's not yet done, uh, but the POC itself is in progress and, and um, that's sort of moving in step with um, the PISP work stream in terms of dependencies on some updates that they're doing uh, for support of the third party API. So big thanks to, you know, Lewis, Powell, um, the rest of the team. I know some there, there are a few people who are no longer on that stream, but yeah, thanks to all of you uh, and, and JJ. Um, that's been uh, really helpful having that work stream on the go and being able to depend so heavily on, on a lot of their great work. Uh, finally, um, some work that we uh, decided to um, do this PI wasn't on the original work plan, but it was something we felt would really improve the ATM and POS integration work. Uh, was to integrate with the test toolkit. So we, um, the applied payments guys have set about uh, putting together basic ATM and POS simulators that are easy for people to use to test uh, some of these use cases and then use those uh, in conjunction with the adapter that we've written to simulate uh, these transactions. But instead of running a full module loop instance to test the integration, use the test toolkit. Uh, and so there I have to say a big thanks again to Sam and to VJ for their help with the test toolkit. Um, the, our plan, our goal for this is to have a packaged uh, ATM uh, pause uh, testing um, solution, anyone who's considering doing some sort of terminal integration into uh, a module loop system can pull that down as a single package, you know, run, use doc compose to just uh, start it up uh, and then start by, you know, simulating all of the flows they're interested with the simulators then replace the simulators with actual terminals or a terminal system um, and work on that until they feel like the ISO 85, 83 to adaptive piece is working as expected, then it should be as simple as replacing the TTK with an actual module loop implementation. Uh, and if the TTK lives up to its promise, that should just work. Uh, so far, so good. I wanna congratulate VJ and, and the guys on that. The TTK is, is a really awesome tool. Um, in terms of uh, status there, uh, the updates on the TTK and the simulators are done. Uh, what's left for us to do is iron out the kinks and package this up nicely, make sure we have good developer documentation shipped and um, that anyone who wants to use these, it's, it's really as simple as a Docker Compose app. Um, 
this work was uh, kicked off before we had really gotten the design around the third party APIs done. So this is still using the direct module of APIs. Um, we don't plan to uh, remove that, but we wanna add support for the third party APIs as well. So depending on the ATM or pause integrators deployment scenario, they could choose to use one or the other. And that's what, uh, that's what we're planning to do next. That's it from me. Um, I would love to get Jordi on to give you a quick demo of what they've built there. Um, show off the TTK with some of its latest features. Uh, Jordi, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm doing that, yeah. All right, I'm um, gonna stop sharing and I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Jordi. Let me start sharing my screen. Um, so, um, I'm Jordi George from Applied Payments. Um, we are working together with Coil on this ATM and post integration project. Um, so we will be doing a um, basic demo on our ATM and post simulators that we have developed um, onto the toolkit um, through our LPS adapter. So um, this is um, our ATM simulator that you are seeing on the screen. So we have developed uh, this as a very lightweight simulators which can easily run on uh, a web server like Tomcat Apache Tomcat, so you can easily deploy it and use it on your local system itself. And as Adrian mentioned earlier, uh, we have made the Docker Compose files for, for uh, LPS adapter and the toolkit us onto a single Docker Compose file now, so you can easily run both of our LPS adapter and the uh, simulators using a single Docker Compose file. Uh, so I have already started the both of simulators, I mean, both of the LPS adapter and uh, to be on my system. Um, so we can just start off by seeing an ATM transaction now. So before that, let me just uh, show the configuration configurations that are available on our ATM simulator now. So there is a small button called the configuration on the top right side of our simulator there. So first is the host configuration where you can use uh, the IP and port to connect to the LPS adapter. So you can send the ISO messages that will be generated from the simulators onto our LPS adapter. And from there, the LPS adapter will map all the fields inclu included in the ISO 8583 message onto the OpenIP format, and then forward it from there to the toolkit. So currently, um, it's all running on my local machine itself. So I can mention the local host as the IP, and we are using the port 3001 on our adapter to receive the uh, transactions. So uh, the next configuration is the terminal ID. So you can just give any name for the terminal ID that you that you want to test. So currently I'm going to give it as ATM12345 and it is added successfully. Then the merchant ID can also be configured just like the same. Then the next will be the merchant name and location. So we can just use uh, any example data that the ISO 853 messages will, uh, will accept. So the terminal ID is of digits eight and merchant ID is of 15 and uh, the merchant name and location may be of 42 of nine. Um, okay, so we have done the configurations uh, for a test transaction here and uh, we can just so these are the available transactions on oh, for our simulators. There is capital trouble, balance and query, transfer, deposit, all of them. But uh, we will be only displaying the cash withdrawal, the cash out scenario in our uh, through the module loop. I mean, the, to the toolkit. So I am going to select cash withdrawal from this selection window. And then we have two options. So if you want to do the module loop transaction, we can go to the module loop and it will direct us to the mobile number entry screen. And if you want to do a card transaction, then it will um, direct us to a card number and ring screen. So I'm going to select Mozilla loop for our demo here. Then the mobile number entry. So I'm going to enter the mobile number that I use you now. And confirm. Next is the amount and risk screen. Just going to enter 300 here. And when I press confirm, it will show that you will be charged one percentage of the amount as uh, the quarter amount that we will be receiving. Uh, but now we are just um, showing the quarter amount that we receive from the toolkit as of now. So uh, 
that we can will calculate uh, some uh, the port amount uh, according to the amount we send and then the next screen will be having an option to enter the OTP also along with this confirmation screen. So I'm going to enter the OTP pressing confirm. So I confirm the quoted amount that I received along with the OTP. So the transaction was successful. Let me just show you the traces on the toolkit. Um, so this is the monitoring window uh, that I have shown in the demo yesterday of the toolkit. So we can see um, the first message is of the get parties using the mobile number that we have in there. And next, uh, the put parties is from the toolkit itself. Then we can see the post transaction request with the amount and all the details that we have registered on our uh, simulators. Um, so all the party identifiers are registered accordingly and the amount is also set. And after this, you can see the put quotes with a quote amount that we have displayed. And after that, the post transfers is done. And then put transfers will be in a committed state if it is successful. Yes, and we got the final put transfers from the toolkit after the transaction is successful. And we will be then dispensing the cash uh, after this on a real ATM machine. So uh, that's the overall cycle of our ATM transaction, which is simulated from our uh, ATM simulator. So we are using ISO 8583 uh, message, as I have mentioned earlier, um, or for both ATM and post simulators here. So let me just go to the post simulator also. Okay, so um, just like the ATM simulators that I have uh, displayed earlier, there is a configuration just like uh, the ATMs. So we can just mention the terminal ID here. Uh, Mercenary also can be configured like the same. Save name location. Save. So there is also a window in both uh, ATM and POS uh, for the keys. So I forgot to mention it earlier. So we are um, only under construction for the keys integration along with the, the, with the simulators onto the uh, onto our adapter. So uh, this is still under construction and we'll be able to show it the next time. So let me go back to the screen where we can start the transaction now. So these are the available transactions on our uh, no, post simulator. So I'll be using the purchase transactions for our demo. Yeah, um, so this is the two options that we can opt for the payment method. Uh, just like the ATM, I will be selecting Mozilla now. Entering a mobile number. Next, oh, sorry, oh, extra number. It will violate the mobile number also. And I'm going to enter an amount. Next, we will be showing the quote amount and confirm the OTP. Then the transaction got successful. And again, going to the uh, toolkit uh, monitoring page, we can see the new mobile number that we have sent, the new party that we have registered, and the amount and the code all on the monitoring page. Yep. So, just like the same flow, we can go for the post transactions also. Uh, so, that's uh, of the both ATM and post transactions. Uh, Adrian, do you want to? Uh, yeah, thanks, more? Jody. Yeah. No, okay. that's that's Thank perfect. You. Thanks very much. Um, so, so the plan will be that this these simulators are are you know contributed as as you know tools for testing, uh, open source. Um, anyone who has you know thoughts on improvements or features that they'd like to see there, please let us know. Um, our plan will be to continue updating these over the next few months, um, so that they you know. Are, are part of a complete sort of terminal testing and integration package that people can use. Um, and, and then I think that's it from our side. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jordi and, and Ranjith and, and team.
um obviously the the key the key stuff i think is going to be a complicated one to deal with over the next uh, month or two but uh input on that also uh welcome and it may have to sort of happen in conjunction with the, the cpm work that um is being done already uh i know we've done a bit of work on figuring out how you would translate keys from an iso system into something we can exchange inside the module loop system um, and that's specifically for things like um transmitting the OTPs securely within the module loop system. So anyone who would like to provide input or has thoughts on that, please uh, let us know as well. Okay, um, Simeon, I think we're, uh, we are we flew through that. So you've, you've, you've gained 10 minutes, you're ahead of time today. Unless there's Boy, a, wait a second before you hand it off, I'm sorry. Adrian, could you speak just briefly? I know Max and company had been thinking about the different pin block formats uh, that would be used for the uh, the uh, wrapping of the OTP values. Uh, and if there'd been some study, I know that's interrelated somewhat also to the security work that we've been doing. Um, and that we obviously don't use the same form of encryption at all within our systems for JSON uh, web security, uh, web signing. Is, is, has there been any thought uh, given to, to that further than what we had talked about maybe a couple of convenings ago? We, we have a conceptual design. Uh, I guess um, what has to happen now is to, to prove that it works. Uh, the, the challenge would be um, decrypting from the pin block and re-encrypting as a JWE uh, inside of some sort of secure enclave. So there's no HSM that supports that function today. But as we discussed, um, our plan would be to define what that would look like. Uh, and if there's a need or if there's sufficient demand, our expectation is that some hardware security vendor would be interested in providing that. Um, so as you point out, Miller, um, and for everyone else's information, the, the traditional way this would work in an ISO 8583 system is every time a pin block moves between different security zones. So, you know, from one, from a terminal to a terminal driving application or from an application to a switch or, you know, crossing admin boundaries, the pin block gets translated from encryption under one key into encryption under a different key. Uh, so as it moves along, it's, it keeps changing. And so that translation operation always happens inside of an HSM, which is aware of, um, which has the uh, access to the keys on both sides, so the keys on both zones. And generally inside the ATM or pause, there'll be keys for that point of sale. So um, bridging from that into module loop means we need to do a translation, not only of the encryption, but of the block itself into a completely different format where um, pin blocks are use um, symmetric encryption. We would want to use a JWE based on uh, asymmetric encryption. So Max has done quite a bit of work on the way we could do that and specifically which pin block formats would allow us to do that. Um, right. There's a document in, in the works to, to you know, lay that all out. But in terms of progress beyond that, no, we, I, I think we would have to demonstrate i think a, a desire from an, a, a deployment to actually have that in place uh, and that would probably motivate an hsm vendor to to implement the necessary functions inside the hsm to to do that translation and on that point um did you speak with uh, uh danford at uh, umoja in uh, tanzania uh, they recently merged. Uh, with I'll defer to Ranjit on that one. I know Ranjit's been um, communicating with Danford. I'm not sure where that is. I, I think uh, it's been it's been difficult to get feedback over the last month or two. But but I'm not sure, yeah. Ranjit, if you have any updates from the Umoja side. I'd love to see that motivated because I think they're probably one of the first places where we'll have a uh, Moja yep. loop-like system and also an ATM network and with someone leaning forward and motivated to do onboarding of various kinds, including his ATM network. Uh, yeah, be, certainly uh, we'd, we'd, uh, be, we'd be really, yeah, we'd, we'd be very happy to support that. I know Ranjith and his team, right. that's, you know, in the absence of a deployment to work on, are trying to build our tooling to make that easier when it happens. Oh, uh, Ranjith, it sounds like you, you wanted to add something there. Yeah, um, so Miller, hi, Adrian. So basically I've been in touch with uh, Danford from Moja as well as uh, Francis from uh, ZEC, Zambia Electronic Clearinghouse. 
and also with Furman from DAT, Digital Effect Telecom. So it's a bit slow for the last um, couple of months, and I believe it's probably due to the COVID situation, but um, I'm setting up calls for the next two weeks in order to find out where the situation is, and then I'll keep you posted on how it is going. From my side. That's great. Yeah, Thank I you, Ranjit. I'm from just noting. Innocent as well. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Right. You might want to touch base with Innocent just to get an update from him to uh, what's going on, on their side. Um, I just want to jump in. I think Max also had a response to your question. Um, yeah, look, on the um, going from a normal uh, un pin under a DES key to pin under a public key on something completely unrelated to Mojo, I'm busy working with one of the 87 vendors right now to have that done. That should actually be available, for, I would say, within the next six to eight weeks anyway. Um, it's the initial one won't use the uh, encrypted the same way we're doing now the whole JWS. It's just going to do a straight encryption. But yeah. I have mentioned this to them, and yeah, well, that will definitely be looked at straight after that, because they, they do at the moment take it from a uh, public key into a into a symmetric key, their normal DES key. But now that we just have to do it the other way, so that is. That whole thing is already underway at the moment. And as I said yesterday, one of the things we want to do is next step of the C of the uh, CPM is start integra at the, integrating it to things like the ISO 8583 adapter. And that would be one of the use cases, one of the use cases that would make us uh, integrate it as well. So we did sort of partly integrate it to the very base CPM for the last convening where we did the POC, where we did everything sort of for well, half in software, half completely un-PCI. But the way we'll be doing it, I'm busy doing it, is completely within PCI standards. So, yeah. Oh, that's very helpful. Thanks, Max. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh -huh. That's great. Um, Adrian, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, that's it. I, I mean, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, as I said, you know, any any further comments or discussion that anyone wants to have, please get hold of us uh, on the ATM and POS side. I think Rangeth and the Applied Payments guys have have probably got the best handle on things, and I know they um, are eager to help. You know, get get people uh, up to speed and using the adapter. So, if anyone has a desire to explore this, please do reach out to them.